The climate crisis is affecting all of us, no matter where we live. In major cities, wildfire smoke is making some summer days dangerous to be outside. In coastal communities, homes are disappearing as water rises. But as with most catastrophes, it is the most vulnerable who are affected most. Nowhere in Canada has this been more true than in the Northwest Territories, where 70% of their residents had to be evacuated due to wildfires in the summer of 2023. My name is Eric Bowman. I'm the communications person at the Canadian Psychological Association, and this is Mindful. Our Psychology Month series continues with a discussion of the wildfires that ravaged the Northwest Territories in the summer of 2023 and that are still smoldering today. If you've been following along on the CPA website, you might already have read the article by Meryl Dean, who was evacuated along with the rest of her community and the people she serves as a psychologist up north. If you haven't, I encourage you to click the link in the show notes to read more about her experiences and those of her compatriots in northern Canada. This conversation is based on that article and picks up where it left off in the fall of 2023. I'm Meryl Dean. Um, I'm a registered psychologist living in Yellowknife, Northwest Territories. I've lived in, in the Northwest Territories since 1988. Became a psychologist later on in life, worked in education up until 2010 when I went back to do this degree, continued working in education, set up a private practice in 2015. And I have worked as an educational psychologist, largely privately though, a private educational psychologist with the school districts in the Northwest Territories and Nunavut, and dabbled in a few other pots as well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, I've traveled extensively across the two territories, I've been in pretty much almost every school in the territory. I think that gives you an incredible perspective of, you know, the students and the the people who uh, go to school up in that area and who uh, who live in that area. And I'm speaking with you today because of this article that you wrote for the uh, educational and school psychology section of the CPA for their newsletter in the wake of the wildfires in 2021, which caused so much of that community and those people that you know, and I presume you yourself to have been evacuated from that area. And were you yourself part of that evacuation? I, I was, but just to correct you, Eric, you said 2021. The evacuations were actually last summer, 2023. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I am confusing them with other wildfires that happened more in BC in 2021. There have been an awful lot in the last uh, few years, eh? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yes. So, yes, I was one of the evacuated. I mean, 70% of the territory was evacuated, so at least sort of on the last round of evacuation, 70% of us was evacuated. So it's actually harder to find somebody in the territory who was not evacuated than it was to find somebody who was evacuated. Right. And tell me a little bit how, about how that process uh, was for you. I, what what exactly happened? Did someone reach out to you? Did they do it uh, via the local media? Does someone go door to door and say, it's time to get out of here? Here are your options. Uh, how does that work? Well, here in Yellowknife, it was actually announced through social media and, and through media. We actually, the fires had been very bad for a number of weeks surrounding the area and uh, surrounding Yellowknife. And, and sort of the biggest fire was between a community 100 kilometers away called Bechico and, and Yellowknife. And, and we had watched it just move closer and closer and closer over about a month. And the community of Bechico had been evacuated to Yellowknife like a month, a month and a half earlier. And they had spent, the, the community people had spent about two and a half weeks in Yellowknife and then were allowed to go home because fire was still burning between the two communities and it was moving closer to Yellowknife. Air quality up here was, was horrid. You know, uh, orange skies, couldn't breathe. It was very, very bad. And we had actually, my husband and I had actually been out on our first holiday since COVID. Mm -hmm. And we came back to Yellowknife three days before the evacuation notice was given. We had actually discussed whether we should come back or if we should just wait to see what happened. But we had family up here and we knew that they would need help because my daughter's husband is an essential worker. And so right. she be responsible for taking her kids out on her own. And we thought, well, if there has to be a better an evacuation, we better be there to support the family. And so we came home 
knowing that we might have to turn around. We then actually, the evacuation notice was issued on a Wednesday. On Monday night, we met as a family to discuss whether we were going to actually leave town early. We were watching how the fire was moving and coming close, how it was approaching at that point. It was about 10 to 15 kilometers from the city. So we were thinking maybe we should be going, leaving. We um, made a decision Monday night at the meeting not to leave. My daughter went home. Then the city issued a press release about the wind shifting and what that might do to the fire. There is only one highway out. Right. And the fire was actually coming up either side of the highway. And with the wind shift, it looked like it would shut off the highway. My daughter phoned me and said, have you seen the press release? I said, I just read it. I think we should leave. And so we left at 6.30 the next morning with the kids and, and headed out. And that evening they issued, that afternoon at five o'clock, they issued the evacuation notice. So we actually missed, we were out early enough to miss the traffic and the traffic jams on the highway. We were also fortunate that we were out early enough to miss um, the, uh, by the time the city had evacu issued the evacuation notice, they were having to pilot the cars through the burn because it had come so close to the highway and, and smoke and things were blocking the highway. So we were, we were fortunate to have escaped that. I've seen some of those videos and the photos and that just looks absolutely terrifying to have to get through that. It's unreal. You know, it was interesting and I, I don't even know how people managed to do it. People in Hay River who had very little notice and, and you know, they they drove through fire much like people from, from Fort McMurray a few years back where, you know, the fire actually blistered the paint on their cars, you know, as they were driving. I was thinking about that, you know, as actually as we were driving back into Yellowknife, we, we had a seven hour stop on the highway 30 kilometers from town while they were trying to manage a burn close to the highway. We, we were stopped on the highway for seven hours along with 10 other cars. And there was a hot spot beside us on the highway that kept just flaming up, you know, right. every 30, 40 minutes, the tree would burst into flames and burn for a couple of minutes, and then it would extinguish itself. And I found it so frightening. I found it really disquieting. And I, you know, why is somebody not dumping water on that? We're right beside it. Is it us? Is it going to change, you know, move? Is it going to, you know, and, and the officers who were there were quite casual about it. You know, no, that's all right. That's just normal. We know what to watch for. Don't worry. But the whole situation and we lack that knowledge and understanding to know what is truly safe. The one thing that, that I got out of your article that I thought was something that we don't think about that often, right? You, you're able to get in a car, you're able to go, you can pack as many family members as you can into that car and, and take off. Well, a lot of people don't have cars. So for them, they have to wait on things like airplanes and they have to wait on different forms of transportation, which you know, the longer that goes, the more dangerous it becomes and that sort of thing. So for the people that you see every day in your communities in, in, in that area, what was it like for some of them to have to uh, make these evacuations to a, an unfamiliar place through means that they weren't expecting? I, I think it was incredibly um, disquieting for them. It was upsetting for some people. It You know, I've had families talk about their elders who were evacuated either out of nursing home here or hospital here. And because they're unilingual Klicho speakers or they speak their own Indigenous language and they don't speak English, they had an explanation of what was happening when they left here. But, you know, the elder who ended up in Vancouver in a hospital who only speaks Klicho and who had no family. I, I can't imagine how, I mean, how traumatic it is for the family, but also for the elder to be put in a situation where you're just not sure what's going on. You're not even sure where you are. It's someplace you've never been and not have the supports you need either for language, to express yourself, to express your needs. 
you know, even thinking of something as simple as our hospital here serves traditional food. We have cultural workers who make sure that elders and, and um, you know, are served traditional food and they have access to traditional food so that they're not relying on sort of hospital food. You know, people, families lined up for a day, a day and a half to be put onto a plane to fly out of town. And, you know, we're allowed to bring a backpack. Right. And yeah. how do you bring a backpack with what you need for you don't know how long the evacuation will be? And, you know, I I sort of laughed because I obviously thought this evacuation was not going to be long. I packed three days of clothes. That's enough to drive down to Edmonton and turn around and drive home. And you have to wear one set of clothes for a second day. Right. To do that. Yeah. So I, I literally thought I obviously I thought in my head we're driving out and we're going to drive back like it's going to be that quick. Um, I, you know, get out there and suddenly we're there for three and a half weeks. Yeah. I, I have the means, fortunately, to be able to go and buy some clothes. But people, many people didn't have the means to do that. I saw people selling things online so that they could get money to buy the gasoline to drive out. Um, yeah. it, it's not, you're just not driving down the road. It's, it's about, it typically costs about $400 worth of gas, $500 worth of gas to get to Edmonton. Yeah. And I think that's something that we don't really think about either, right? We think about evacuations. We sort of, I think, at least I sort of have in my head that, well, the government's going to take care of the essential things. You're not going to have to take care of anything because you're being evacuated for your safety. But there's an enormous cost that comes with a lot of this to individuals who probably don't have the means to do it, but also you have no choice but to do it. And that puts someone in a terrible position. And certainly, I mean, there's many families still in town dealing or in town or in the communities even that were evacuated, still dealing with the aftermath of the financial burden of those evacuations. And, you know, I, I talk about people in Yellowknife, that's sort of my immediate, you know, my immediate group. But I look at people down in, in Hay River, for example, who in the last year, well, uh, almost a year to the day, they had been evacuated twice, once for flooding, once for a fire, and then were evacuated a second time a month and a half later again for fire. They've had three evacuations in about 13 months. And they've all been lengthy. Um, the, the shortest one was the first fire one. They've all been lengthy. I had been talking to a family actually on the, the, day, bef the day of the anniversary of the flooding evacuation. And they had said to me, we hope we'll be back in our home next week. So they hadn't even managed to move back into their home from the flooding. The forest fire came through the next day and they lost their home. Oh, yeah. That seems so devastating. And even, and, and the other thing that I found just uh, try, hard to wrap my head around is, you know, you get evacuated from these smaller communities, a uh, uh, Hay River or somewhere even more north, and they evacuate you to the nearest sort of urban center, which in a lot of cases would have been Yellowknife. Well, then Yellowknife has to be evacuated. So you're just yeah. continually displaced, displaced, displaced until you end up somewhere where hopefully you can hang out long enough to end up going home to a home that hopefully still exists, right? So the people in Fort Smith were evacuated to Hay River because of the Wood Buffalo Fire. They were evacuated to Hay River on, I think, a Friday, it was, or something. And then Saturday afternoon, they were evacuated out of Hay River. And a few of them did come north. Fortunately, most of them on that evacuation chose to go south. Yeah, there were people who were evacuated again and again and again. You know, and, and what too, we, we don't consider is sort of the effects of the people left behind who weren't evacuated. So I talked about the fire here that was burning between Bechico and Yellowknife, and that's the one that sort of forced the evacuation of, of Yellowknife. So there's Bechico on one side of the river, Edzo on the other side of the river. Edzo never did have to evacuate, but their service center is Yellowknife. Right, um, right. Of course, it's 100 kilometers away. When Yellowknife was evacuated and the airport was shut down to everything but firefighting flights, 
those communities, Bechico, Edzo, Wati, which is a fly, you know, and then a number of flying communities sort of, you know, surrounding Yellowknife and going north from Yellowknife, all rely on uh, air transport for their food. And suddenly the airport in Yellowknife is shut down. And so the grocery store in Wekwati or Gamati can't get groceries because they're not being flown into Yellowknife. And so there were, were issues with some of the communities running slow, who weren't evacuated, running low on, on supplies because the service center was closed down. And, and that was certainly, I think, something that sort of nobody had, had seen through you know, the government planners, the disaster relief people. Nobody had seen that through of, of the impact of sort of on those much smaller communities that weren't evacuated. This is one thing I really wanted to focus on here is this idea of being prepared in many different facets of this. One, one of the things, right, we didn't anticipate that even the communities that weren't evacuated wouldn't have access to food, right? That was not anticipated. Uh, you talk about people who get evacuated to Edmonton, get placed in a, a shelter, a temporary shelter outside of Edmonton, and then are told, well, you know, to access food and the supports that you need, you're going to have to get into downtown Edmonton and take a bus. And these are people who've never taken a city bus before. They're not familiar with that system in any way. And there's a language barrier for many people. Uh, it becomes that much more difficult for, for people in that circumstance, right? You know, as Northerners, I think we, we tend to have sort of a certain resilience and, and we tend to band together. And it was interesting to see what sort of happened in various cities down south with, you know, in towns that had large evacuation populations. Because the GNWT is such a small organization, they paid the Alberta communities, emergency response teams in the various communities, to provide the services for the evacuees. And, and so services were very different because it's something that's municipally ran in Alberta. And so it looks very different depending upon where you were. But, um, you know, some of the communities were very open to hearing sort of some of the Northerners issues and concerns. And so, for example, the group running it in Calgary ended up setting up a bus that just ran between all the hotels where evacuees were so right. that they could actually get to see friends without having to navigate that city. You know, the, the services that were offered were truly wonderful um, and, and they were supportive, but they were difficult and it was very unequally distributed, if that makes sense. So some people were very fortunate and they were able to get hotel rooms and able to get places to stay. Whereas I know of other people who spent, you know, a week, waiting to get a hotel room you know so there's there was a very inconsistent um services support for people again and and you know some of us were were sort of the privileged of the evacuation we were able to stay with family or we were able to have the resources to rent a, a house or whatever we needed for the length of time we were evacuated but the people who are most vulnerable didn't have those resources and unfortunately for some of them they also ended up being the ones with the least able to access resources once they got south. I think this is one of the ways that climate change and the effects of it and, and you know, the disasters that we're seeing as a result really affect the most vulnerable a lot more. Even within the same community, the most vulnerable are affected more. And they end up bearing some of that cost. I mean, you were saying some people aren't reimbursed already and, and they're still fighting that battle as they return to where their home still is or maybe used to be. And it's on that end, as people come back after the evacuation, where a whole support system sort of has to spring up from nowhere that hasn't necessarily been anticipated. This is sort of where I want to close this off is, is what does that look like now and what should it look like? How how can we support those people? I know there's a lot of mental health effects that come with this. It must be something that you're seeing personally in, in your practice every day. Um, and it's got to linger for years. I honestly feel we didn't, We ha have we done a good job of supporting all of our people that have experienced it? Um, you know, I would like to think I was informed enough, I'm aware enough of trauma, I'm aware enough of trauma responses to sort of, you know, deal with with it. And yet, 
we're not. We we continue to be triggered when it's a smoky day. Um, yeah. You know, we're, this winter, I'm driving out to Bechico, and there's still hot spots burning on the highway at minus 35. And and I, you can smell the wood smoke. You can smell the burn. You can smell the fire still. Right. And and, and you can see the smoke and some days you can see flames and it's it 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 causes that whole anxiety about the entire situation to reoccur what's going to happen you know the uncertainty of of the future for people is is very very frightening you know Inuvik had fires surrounding it this this summer and and there must take. There are no. There are very few trees. There's some trees close by Inuvik, but right. it's it's not. You know, and and then you know you go further north to Taktayaktak, and and their community is falling into the ocean um, because of climate change, and yeah. they're having to move all their houses, and people's ways of life are are being dramatically shifted because of it. We, many of our small communities, families rely on hunting and trapping for at least a, a component of their food supply, if not all of it. And of course, the burns have affected the wildlife and it's affected how animals are moving and where they are. And so, you know, there isn't hunting there. The animals aren't around possibly this winter, uh, you know, or they've moved into Yellowknife like we have wolf packs sort of in town right now oh, really? because, because they're they're searching for for sources of food that have been burnt out so typically when they were out of town they've moved in closer wow that's uh I, there's something really apocalyptic about a vision of a wolf pack moving through the center of yellow knife isn't there <laughs> Well, yeah, and, and not really the center, but like we live on the edge of town and we've had wolf sightings in our neighborhood. The people who uh, you deal with on a day to day basis in your practice, I mean, how are they dealing with it? How how are people at large coping with uh, the return and the trauma and, you know, the uncertainty of the future? Largely, we're we're moving on. There there is a portion of the population that have made decisions to move south, um, and we've seen that there's actually been an exodus from Yellowknife and from Hay River as well. Fort Smith is is that a realistic solution? I I don't think the South is any better off. We have a brother-in-law in Kamloops or Kelowna, and you know we we, we evacuated together in Edmonton. Um, right. You know, so. The South isn't that much more, but I think talking, it's it's important that people understand that there is a sense of efficacy of, of things that they can do. I, I think it can be overwhelming, particularly if we spend too much time focusing on the news and, you know, spending time sort of glued to the news channel or exposing our children to all of that. It, it just comes in waves again and again and again. We, we need to know that there are things we can change or else we, we develop a sense of existential dread of there's nothing. And so what's the point? And that's then you see the increase in the anxiety and the sense of helplessness and just people moving into that funk. And so I, I think looking for ways, finding ways that we can help um, change the situation, however minimal that may be, <laughs> but knowing that, you know, with every drop there, there does become a full pool ultimately, if we can all make the drops. So it's, it's, it's in helping to believe that there's um, things we can do to affect change, at least within our environment. And what are maybe maybe give some examples of some of those things? What are some of the things that people are doing to affect that change, to uh, take that step forward so that they're not overwhelmed with this existential dread? I, I think things as simple as, uh, you know, people talking now more about fire smarting, because, of course, fires are in our our mindset right now. We also know, you know, as we've talked up here in the north, a lot of our energy is is trucked in. We're seeing a bigger move towards alternative energy sources that probably in the north aren't, aren't going to be able to provide 100% of the power that we need. 
but certainly can add it can act as an adjunct to other things. And so how can we engage in those things? How can we improve sort of wood-fired heat in smaller communities and make it more efficient and effective? Putting in banks of solar panels in communities, growing our own food, becoming more self-reliant on our food. One of the interesting things that came out of the evacuation, approximately 200 people stayed behind to help feed all the firefighters and the workers. And they ended up uh, using uh, a couple of small commercial greenhouse operations here in town to help feed the workers, but then sort of sought permission from people who were evacuated to come and could, can we go and harvest your gardens to help feed the firefighters? Right. Yeah. Of people said, go for it. You know, it's, it's sitting there. And, and uh, so it was interesting to, um, I just recently read an article that talked about how much food was actually put supplied locally to feed the firefighters and the people who remain behind. And, you know, that sense of efficacy that, yeah, we can actually grow food up here. That's not something that was really thought about 15 years ago. You know, a few people did small scale gardening, but we didn't have community gardens. We didn't have food production happening. You know, that that hundred mile what is it? The five hundred mile diet, or whatever they call it. Where you're right, trying yes. <laughs> up here, up here, that's pretty slim pickings, except for meat, or at least it was fifteen years ago. And you know, we've we've started that process of, you know, people have started that process of trying to produce more food and finding ways to produce it. We don't have a lot of soil. We're we're on shield country, but right. you know what? We discovered you can grow potatoes in stacks of old tires. Yes, yes. I I tried to do that myself one summer. Uh, the the <laughs> potato. Oh, it wasn't stacks of tires. It was uh, a bunch of rings from an old barrel, a, a metal barrel that we'd had. And uh, I just I found that potatoes are an inefficient thing for for me to grow in my garden because they're very cheap at the store, and I'm better <laughs> served making tomatoes grow and peas and beans and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, I, I I love that method, and yeah, you just move another tire on and another layer and keep growing them up. Yeah, that's uh, that's terrific. So you work in schools a lot. What does it look like when kids return to school? What are the schools doing? Are they talking about this a lot? Are they trying to distract the kids and and uh, move them toward doing something uh, of their own that they can get behind? Uh, what does it look like for, for kids? I think when we first returned, there was a lot of talk about the experiences that people had and, you know, maybe even in some ways, some educational discussion about, you know, differences between being in the North and living in the South, um, because it was pretty eye opening for a lot of kids talking um, and, and sharing and I think communicating with the kids the changes in our communities, because the communities did look radically different when we came back. You know, we have few, huge fire guards cut now around the city. Our landscape, the landscape around the city has changed significantly as it has around Hay River and, and the other communities. Talking to, you know, even one of the, for for the kids that drove the highway, you know, seeing a totally burnt out community, the community of Enterprise was was totally burnt. I think there were two two or three buildings left. And and they had to drive through that both ways, going out and coming home um, right. on the evacuation. And, you know, talking about it, it's a very frightening sight to see, but being able to talk, you know, what we've we we we've been fortunate, like nobody nobody lost their lives. Yes. In all of this evacuation, nobody lost their lives due to fire. And so keeping that in mind that knowledge that, you know, there are ways of keeping people safe. And and so just reassuring them that, you know, there are plans, there are things that we can do. And it is important to stay informed, but not to dwell on it, to know that there are differences. And, and certainly the schools, a number of the schools that I work in, I have seen increase sort of what we might call tier one, you know, stress and anxiety work and working on kids to help them be more aware of how they're feeling and how they can calm themselves and make themselves feel somewhat better. But, you know, and and helping them see that they are resilient, that we've done this now. We know, you know, we know we can do it as difficult as it is. 
But right. even then, typically you have some variation of of degree of effect, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. You know, it might be newer staff who didn't know the student or whatever. Because the evacuation happened so close to school opening even, we had teachers who quite literally had just arrived in town that mm -hmm. the day before the evacuation. They were on their first day of orientation. Welcome to the North. Yeah, and I, I'm sure that retention of people up in that area is already an issue, and now it's probably a, a more significant one, right? Well, it certainly was with the fires, yeah. There are so many ripple effects from a climate catastrophe like the one experienced by Merrill and her community this past summer, and they will be felt for a long time, even if there are no more disasters in 2024, which isn't a certainty. Thanks to Merrill for joining me today on Mindful and to you at home for listening, streaming, downloading and reviewing today's episode and for following along with us throughout Psychology Month. Check the show notes for the article Merrill wrote about the wildfires and children in the Northwest Territories. Mindful is written, hosted and published by me, Eric Bullman. Our producer is Jamie Montgomery and our theme song is Avenues by David Taylor. <laughs>